I'm Javier Barrera for Insight. Today I'm with Adam Johnson, author of The Orphan Master's Son, A Portrait of Life Today in North Korea. Adam Johnson, thank you for coming today. Hey, my pleasure to be here. Thank you, Javier. Tell us a little bit about the book and what drew you to telling the story. The book is a novel. Uh, it's a work of the imagination, though I did a tremendous amount of research for the book. Um, it tells the story of uh, hopefully a person who transcends all levels of North Korean society. It's about a young man who's born in an orphanage and you know there are very few people to advocate for, for orphans um, in North Korea and as he moves into the military he does many functions a lot of them are kind of grim and as we move through the DPRK we gradually move from the rural parts of like Chongjin, where, the, where much of the novel set, closer and closer to Pyongyang, which is the center of power. And eventually we come close to the, the dear leader himself, Kim Jong-il, who is the black hole that warps all reality around him. You traveled to North Korea in 2007. Mm -hmm. um, what surprised you the most, or what was the most unexpected thing you found? Well, traveling there um, is a pretty uh, canned you know, endeavor. Uh, they only open the country a couple weeks a year unless you're a diplomat or a business person. Um, they tell you when you'll arrive and when you'll leave, and they show you what they, they want you to see. It's not legal for a citizen of the DPRK to interact with a foreigner without special training. So I knew going in that I wouldn't have a genuine interaction with a citizen. And I didn't try. That might have you know imperiled someone. I'll never forget on my arrival at Susun Airport, um, you know, traveling from the north where the airport is toward the capital. I'd only been in the country 20 or 30 minutes, and I saw coming out of the capital on a kind of abandoned road, a dump truck filled with people in the back. And I asked my main minder, I said, who are those people and where are they going? And she said, they're, going, they're volunteering to help with the harvest. And I'd seen those kind of terrified folks in the back of a dump truck. And I said, they volunteered? And she said, everyone must volunteer. And that's how I first understood the kind of reality that I was entering. The world of the North Koreans seems to conform to fiction. Um, how much of the outside truth actually reaches them? Uh, it's a place where uh, there are no magazines, where there are no outside broadcasts, there's no internet. Um, the radios that come off the factory lines come without a dial because they're preset to the state propaganda stations. And to tamper with a radio to receive VOA or broadcasts from South Korea that have alternative views is an offense that could get you sent away to a camp. Um, so there are no al alternative views that, that I know. When I was there, <clears throat> I had the suspicion that the people I interacted with, and they were all elites from Pyongyang who'd, who'd benefited from this system, who were living relatively comfortably in the capital. I had the illusion that they knew things um, weren't true, that, that their propaganda version wasn't accurate, but they seemed baffled as to what the real truth might be. Uh, my minders, and we had a few of them, they knew all the capitals of the world, they knew uh, all the mountain ranges and continents, they knew the facts of the world, but the essence of things. What was London? What was Beijing seemed to completely elude them. They didn't have any of the references from popular media, from travel, from literature, from discussing things with friends that we all have to create a composite of, of what a place was. And so to my minder, there was no difference between Mogadishu, which was a capital, and Paris, which was also a capital. Though I really felt that she, she knew that there were great and amazing places out there. She just, it was a void um, attached to a name. How much of what you saw or learned about North Korea did you incorporate in your book? Hmm. A lot of the details in the book are, are fact-based. You know, when a character has his tattoo cut off, that was based on a real incident when Charles Jenkins, a US Marine, you know, went to North Korea. Um, so most of those details are there. But what I had to fill in was the human reality of living in a place where spontaneity can't exist, where revealing yourself and your true inner thoughts is counter to the state and could get you 
uh, cast in the light of suspicion that might have grave consequences. There's a point in the novel when one of the characters says to his child, on the outside I will denounce you in public, mm -hmm. but on the inside I will be holding your hand. Mm -hmm. um, what does that say about North Korea? Mm -hmm. The three generations rule means that you go with your family, that if someone within your uh, social familial unit commits something that's deemed a crime against the state, not only do they go, their children go, their parents go, their brothers and sisters, enough people are found around them to just pull a hole out of that community for that whole family. And that's the main form of terrorism that the government uses against people, is that not only would you do something wrong, everyone around you would pay for that, for that infraction. And that's what causes the, the true paranoia, is that, and the, and the self-policing within families, everyone's monitoring everyone else for an error, or even a perceived error, that could cost them all everything. Um, and in that climate, when would you risk telling your wife or your child, you know, this is all a lie. This propaganda is all wrong. Or so-and-so got denounced, but it was a mistake. They're true. And I try to imagine how I would teach my children to retain their humanity, but also not to lose the game of survival by making a small mistake. And I tried to find those moments in my book where people would share their hearts that would take that risk. Dear leader, Kim Jong-il has a place in your novel. Mm -hmm. How did you envision him? At first, I didn't want to put much of Kim Jong-il in the book because, you know, I found two things early on. One, capturing the true darkness of North Korea <clears throat> was really not possible in the book. It, 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 it stunted the book and the characters. It was too heavy a backdrop for which people could be shown in high relief. Um, and the absurdity. You know, the difference between nonfiction and fiction is that fiction must be believable. And a lot of, of the nonfiction of North Korea is not believable. But as I progressed in the book and as I did my research, I came to understand that this one story in North Korea was all, and that it truly was written by one human being. And he was the great scriptwriter that had commandeered a nation and made them all play roles to his liking. And the more I understood that, the more I really felt to understand that country, we had to see the person who was doing this. We needed to physically know the mind that had made the reality of the entire nation. And then I was charged with the task of bringing um, a vilified, ridiculous dictator to life in a realistic, literary, human way. And I thought about the dear leader a great deal. I had to find his weaknesses, his vulnerabilities, his strengths, his intelligence, and make him human. You would expect a book like this to be pretty dark um, and pretty demanding on the reader, but I mm -hmm. found that there was a really sharp sense of humor, mm -hmm. especially in that scene in Texas. Um, how did you find a way of working humor into your story? I think North Korea is funny in many ways. Um, it is absurd. I think it's overly mocked, you know, um, in popular media by things like Team America World Police or, okay. you know, notions of this, um, it, which was a funny movie. It was a satire. I, I think it just has to be balanced with the real fates of, of, of the suffering citizens there. And humor's okay as long as it's in conjunction with a full portrait of who they are and, and what they're going through. Um, the absurdity of North Korea is shocking. And the ab absurdity comes into play whenever someone has omnipotence and can do anything they want. Uh, and you mix that with propaganda, where Kim Jong-il shoots 11 holes in one in his first game of golf, etc. And that, <clears throat> you know, when Kim Jong-il walks by, the trees carve revolutionary slogans in their bark in his honor. Um, things like this are, are, are pretty laughable. Uh, what little Americans know about North Korea comes through very sparse news reports. Mm -hmm. Um, with so few accessible facts about such a secretive nation, um, how can your how can these fictional narratives illuminate? Uh, what did you hope to illuminate? Hmm. I tried to use imagination and my artistic craft to build a portrait of something that we can't see, but we know must be there. I tried to base it on 
research and oral history. Um, but the truth is it's unverifiable and I have to be okay with what I've created. And I, I, I am, I, I think I made a wonderful portrait of how people might compose themselves and share their human dimension in a place where that's dangerous. Though we won't know, that won't be verified until freedom comes to that place and North Korean writers and North Korean filmmakers can begin to tell their own stories. And I hope that happens sooner than later. And, you know, maybe they'll look back at my book and say, that was a, that was a, you know, a wonderful portrait. Thanks for doing that for us. Or maybe they'll say, you got it all wrong. You know, nice shot, but no, here's the truth. And I would, that was what I was trying to find anyway when I began this book. And I would be happy to, you know, set my version aside for the true version. The heart of the novel are the North Korean people. Mm -hmm. um, but there are pockets of hope. Mm -hmm. in, in your novel, throughout the whole novel. Mm -hmm. um, what does this say about the human condition? Well, I think one of the questions the novel, you know, kind of interrogates a little bit is, you know, what does it mean to survive when you have nothing to live for? You know, who, who are we? Are, are, can we become animal-like or robot-like? And I, I believe not, you know. Uh, even if people's true desires and needs are stored away long term in the in the deep freezer of the North Korean you know experience I believe they can be thought out I believe they can be brought to life and these are people who are just like us they want love they want fulfillment they want connection they want family they want things to outlast them you know and um, if I didn't believe hope was there and a part of that um, it would be, you know, to lose faith in, in everyone, even myself. And, and I don't believe that at all. Thank you so much for stopping by. Sure, Javi. My pleasure.